Okay. Hey everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to the session. Uh, let's see, I'm just making sure my Facebook feed is hooked in as well. Uh, okay, I think we should be rolling. Uh, thank you so much everyone. Thanks for coming in. Uh, happy Sunday. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy. And um, I just want to say uh, I'm honored to be with you uh, again, right, in this time of sensitivity um, and uncertainty. Uh, and I look forward to sharing time with you here in our sacred space today. Uh, <clears throat> so today, before we uh, open sacred space, uh, I want to just say a, a quick thing about uh, just setting some expectations around how much longer we will do these sessions. Uh, and the quick answer is that we're gonna do these sessions for as long as uh, people are signing up and watching them on here and on Facebook. Uh, and then like with anything else, if we see the numbers start to decline, uh, that'd be our signal that um, uh, you know the need out there is less uh, and eventually we'll just stop doing uh, the sessions. Uh, as we do these, the sessions will remain free, obviously, they'll remain in sacred space, uh, no commerce, no sales pitches, uh, all the rest of it. Uh, but the idea here is that um, um, so I got the, those of you who know me, you know that I got the signal from my muse, right, to sort of start these. Um, but the continuing signal, like the signal to continue, I'm going to sort of wait to get from uh, all of you. And the idea that I just wanted to share is that if you are gaining comfort and benefit from these sessions uh, in this time of, you know, just uncertainty and um, and everything going on out there, uh, I would uh, suggest, uh, not even recommend or certainly not wagging my finger, but the thing I would suggest is to, uh, if, if you are gaining, do not hoard the experience to yourself. Uh, spread it to other people, uh, tell people about it. Uh, I'm not sell selling anything, you're not selling anything. So if, if it is good for you, then spread it. Um, because, you know, the, the, the sort of thing that I am just, um, you know, the signal that I'm getting from so many people is that, you know, the, you're all over the world right now. You're in like, you know, Asia everywhere. And, um, um, and the thing is that I think it's something like one quarter or of the Earth's population is under stable order right now, which is breathtaking, right? And um, you know, there's no one on the planet who's not going through, you know, some experience like this right now, uh, with all of the sort of fear and uh, what, in my opinion, and you know, in our opinion, um, this kind of unarticulated create for the comfort and guidance of the sacred. Right? And when I say are not articulated, it's this sense of, um, you know, we feel this craving, we feel this emptiness, but we don't have words to put to it. Uh, and, you know, in our society, if we don't have words to put to it, then we assume it's not real, right? Which is not true, but that's how we're taught. And so even if we're just spreading the basic idea of like, look, there is this thing called sacred. Uh, it's not, you know, it's within you. It's not, nobody's telling you what it is, right? But there are ways to sort of get closer into it so that you can get the comfort from the wellspring within you, then um, that's great, right? That would be a nice thing to uh, spread. So anyway, if this is good for you, please do spread it. Um, uh, you know, as a, an online marketer, spread it over and over. It takes multiple hits for people, even from friends, to say, oh, okay, I'm seeing this like the third time from her. It must be important to her. <laughs> so it, it's just, you know, basic blocking and tackling on the internet. It does take multiple uh, sort of goes at the, uh, goes at the, at, at the apple. And then um, <clears throat> for those of you who do share, uh, with friends, on email, on Facebook. Um, the, the additional thing I would love is to hear from you um, because the thing is, I'm just doing this because I'm following my muse like a blind pig. <laughs> that, that's, that's why I'm here, right? Um, and But when you do share to your own friends and family, 
uh, I would love to hear from you back, like one-on-one. -on -one. You can just email me. Actually, for those of you who don't have my email, it's just already already at presidemeditation.com. You can just shoot me an email there anytime. I would love to hear from you about how you explained it or described it to your friends and family, right? Because it, when you actually have, you can sit here and be like, you know, kind of I'm like your tour guide and you're just kind of like soaking in all this stuff and that's great, I love that, I'm soaking it in too. But when you actually have to go out and describe it to someone else who may be a little skeptical, maybe a little like, what is this? Um, when you actually do that, I would love to hear back from you what you actually say to them. Because uh, then I will learn and clarify, right? Because it, when you have to see, when someone says like, well, so sacred, what do you mean by that? You mean like going to church? You're like, no, it's not church. It's just a religion. No, it's not a religion. And when you actually kind of spit it out and explain what it is, um, often you surprise the other person, you surprise yourself. And, uh, you know, I would like to be surprised too. <laughs> I would like to hear what you have to say. Um, so it clarifies in your head, please tell me what you told them so that I can get insight into why it's actually helpful for you, for us. Like, I'm learning here too. Uh, I mean, there's no master plan. I'm just kind of making this up as I go. Um, so if you can help me echo and amplify like what you're feeling, what's useful, what's not useful, uh, that, would, that would be really helpful. Um, also, I've had uh, friends who have asked for um, captions and translations, Italian captions, French captions. Um, those are being worked on. Friends, are, we, we've like done a machine, quick Google Translate, and they're kind of going through. Uh, it's actually quite amusing uh, to see how some of this translates into other languages. <laughs> um, but if you are interested in a different language, let me know. If you can help with the translation, let me know. Um, so I will keep supporting this effort. We will keep supporting. Um, but would love to have you share with more people so we keep the line sort of flat, growing a little bit, you know, just kind of consistent. So I know that there's um, a consistent sort of need out there. <clears throat> okay. So that's my, I, I don't know if you count that as a sales pitch. <laughs> but I, I um, that, was the, that was the one thing where I wanted to ask everyone for kind of a favor to kind of help out. Uh, so I definitely wanted to do it kind of outside of before we start forming sacred space. Okay. So um, there's some things we want to do now in our time together in sacred sacred space. I'll just talk through them. Number one, um, <clears throat> um, to first we'll set sacred space. Two, uh, there's one specific topic I want to talk about, which is the power of the automatic sacred. Like those times throughout the day where you are automatically in the realm of the sacred without even knowing about it. So you get that nourishment, but you don't have words to describe it. So it's like not a real thing. Uh, and when you name something, you're able to kind of, you know, focus more of your energy and attention on it to extract more of the, the gift that it's trying to give you, right? Um, uh, there are a couple uh, Q&A items that I want to uh, sort of answer. Uh, there is an, an, another exercise I'll suggest to you as, as we disperse at the end of this. Uh, there's one short poem that I want to read, uh, and then we'll close Sacred Space. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open our Sacred Space here. Um, so I would like to formally uh, sort of set our Sacred Space here together. This is a space uh, where we, you know, declare as uh, devo devoid of fear, threat, and control uh, for us to open to uh, higher guidance, however we receive that, within our own selves. Um, a safe sanctuary space for us all to relax and surrender uh, with no danger or threat. Um, when people say, uh, is there a specific doctrine or a set of beliefs, the answer is no. Uh, and the reason for that is, <clears throat> in pure sacred space for you to really let your guard down, right? You need to know that uh, no one's gonna come in and say, oh, and you believe in this specific thing because we all do here. And you're like, what? I didn't sign up for that. And you know, your guard is down and, and they kind of blindside you. So, uh, so it's to be open 
know, you may still reject it, but to be open to higher guidance from your within your own self. However you choose, how however you feel that it comes to you, not from the outside. Uh, so that we can all partake of the emotional nourishment and spiritual nourishment that comes from being in sacred space together as a group. Um, and in opening sacred space today, I will propose the usual principles that we all follow the, the four, following four principles of uh, number one, confidentiality. And the way we do that online is uh, you can ask a question, uh, but to anonymize it, you would go into your profile and just you know set your username to Mickey Mouse or you know Harry Potter or something. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the way we would manage anonymization here. So confidentiality. Uh, Standard Vegas rules, what happens in sacred space stays in sacred space. Number two, uh, no threat, uh, no fear, no controlling, no fixing, no tough love, uh, no recommendations. Oh, here, here's a book that'll fix that. And it's like, you know, you don't know that, right? You're just kind of controlling uh, with a hidden threat of if you don't read the book, you're stupid, right? So no recommendations, free or otherwise. Uh, we're here simply to hold space for each other for us to have a safe space to be afraid, uh, to be anxious, um, to be happy and relaxed, and to feel a little guilty about being happy and relaxed, uh, and to be okay with all of that, and to hold space for all of that, right? Um, and so, um, and then finally, no commerce, right? Uh, nothing may be sold, recommended, or suggested. Uh, we're here for your energy, not for the things you bring, right? We're here for what you are, not for what you do or not for what you provide. Uh, you are in uh, your, our joy of being together is for all of us to be together, uh, as it's the classic saying is not as a means to an end, but as an end within ourselves, right? So for what you are, not for what you do. And then finally, there's no expectation of participation, no pressure to do anything, no pressure to ask questions, chat, not chat. Uh, again, the nourishment comes from the held space, comes from your presence and attention, uh, from what you are, not from what you do. And all of us now together, and you can do this solo, and we've talked about that in past sessions, but here we can also do that <clears throat> together and all of us doing it for each other. We're kind of spotting each other, we're, we're holding each other up, amplify, amplifies the power of that sacred. So that um, very often you get a cleaner, stronger signal um within yourself individually okay uh so this is what i'm proposing and if you are not okay with that uh with everything i've just described uh we would like to give you a moment to um uh mutually respectfully withdraw from the group uh and so we will not have sacred space together and that's okay we'll just catch up with you later in the profane space and we'll have a latte we'll hang out we'll still still do business Right, no worries at all. Uh, but for now, we're going to move into sacred space together, as I've described. Uh, and if any of you are not okay with that, go ahead and withdraw, and uh, we'll we'll hit you up. We'll catch you later with other stuff. Okay. Okay. All right. So, with those of you who are still here, we will move together into sacred space. Confidentiality, no fear, threat of control, no commerce, no expectation of participation. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to go into the, the one sort of main topic I wanted to cover, and then we'll do Q&A, uh, and then we'll have our exercise and poem. So one overall topic here is... Um, Um, I want to talk about how the sacred uh, appears in different sort of, well, what, what kind of guidance comes to you when you're in the sacred, okay? Uh, to help you sort of understand kind of the inside baseball, if you will, of the physics of transformation. Uh, we've talked about uh, caterpillar, uh, cocoon, <clears throat> butterfly, this sort of arc of transformation, this pattern. And this a pattern like this is called, you can call it a pattern, you can call it a form, you can call it an archetype, which is a fancier word for it. And um, 
the beauty of going into like cocoon mode or, or, or sacred space mode to get higher guidance, right, on how to navigate your life path forward in the profane once you like go back out into the arena with your sword and shield is that what you will often be gifted with in the form of a, a flash of insight, uh, uh, sort of a brilliant idea, a strong intuition, a vision, even a dream, is that you will see um, a pattern, right? So for those of you who were here for the first session, when I talked about, you know, it's not, you can see this punishment, but you can also see this whole pandemic thing as transformation, right? As a trigger of transformation. And the pattern that transformation takes is not you're bad and I'm gonna beat the crap out of you, right? Um, the pattern transformation takes is your caterpillar, you trip fall into this downward sort of, you know, seemingly punishing, and it is painful, sort of slide into a cocoon, right, tomb, which then turns into a womb and the butterfly emerges on the other side. And the power of that pattern is that, I mean, the comfort it gives is that it tells you that the piece you're on is part of a larger pattern. And when you see the contours of that pattern, um, you can navigate it. It will still be difficult, but you can navigate it with less fear. I mean, does it rise to the level of meaning? That's kind of a more philosophical question we can talk about later, but there is at least definitely a pattern that you see the events of your life following. And you're like, okay, uh, I may not like this pattern. <laughs> I may want to do some sort of special things to try to move myself to a different pattern, uh, which is also an option, right? But for now, as I'm on this roller coaster, I can see the pattern and, and the beauty of seeing the pattern is that if you can see that there's a sharp corner coming in the road in front of you, right, you may not like to take that sharp, road, sharp corner, but when you know it's coming, maybe like 30 seconds before, 20 seconds before, you can brace yourself as the car goes around, right? So even that little bit of visibility into like the next turn in the curve in the road um, uh, will be helpful. So I wanted to kind of talk about um, the kinds of patterns you get. And then at the same time, I got a bunch of questions from people saying, well, you know, this whole sacred space thing, I, I, I like it. <coughs> I like it when we're all together and doing it together. But when I'm alone, I really have a lot of challenges with sitting still or I sit still, I'm in the shower, I'm like taking my walk and I can't hear anything, you know. Um, or I just have these like random daydreams fantasies that I don't really understand what's going on. Uh, or I do hear things and the things I hear are kind of scary. And what do I do about that? You know, it's like um, I have dreams of being chased by like home invaders and boogeymen and other things like that. Um, what kind of higher guidance is that, right? How, what, do, what do I even do with that? And so um, I decided to pick a topic for today which will answer both of those questions, like what kinds of patterns come up and how do you uh, receive patterns sometimes uh, in a mode that is more automatic, right? So like the automatic sacred. So when I do healing, um, the overwhelming pattern is that when you enter a healing cycle, right, i.e. a transformation cycle, because when you're like, I need to heal this, I've had these childhood wounds, or I've had this sort of trauma, and I need to sort of, you know, it's affecting my relationships. I'm, I'm not gonna lose another relationship. I'm not gonna have another kid stop talking to me. Like it's like, I, I need to sort of figure out what is the deal with this wounded pattern within me and heal it somehow. So that's kind of what I do, right, for, uh, uh, for a living. <laughs> and so my experience with, you know, the thousands of people I've worked with is that when you enter into a healing cycle, a transformation cycle, uh, and the majority of people, within a couple of days, your dreams will start to fire up. This is your dreams when you're sleeping, usually. And um, without getting into all the theory and explanations of why that might be happening, I'll just tell you, you know, I've I've worked with you know probably over ten thousand people at this point on this kind of thing on a one-on-one -on -one or group basis, uh, and it's just a thing. This is just what happens. People's dreams start firing up. It's not something that I 
wanted to do. It's not something I actually talk publicly about so much. Um, but over the years, I've been pulled into helping people uh, read their dreams. Um, because it's fun, it's interesting, I, I've realized it is a part of my bliss, but also because it is a, um, it's a little bit embarrassing to say it like this, but it is a it is a labor saving device for me. <laughs> when you bring me a dream and I help you read the dream, and I'm like, this is I'm just translating the telegram. I don't know. You you tell me if it means anything. You know, they kind of like all the blood drains from their face, and they're like, okay, okay, I got it, and they go away. And we save like months, right, of going around in circles, um, talking about this and that. They're like, you know, just uncomfortable naturally. When the dream tells you something, it like hits you in the face, and you're like, "Fine," uh, and then you you have this sort of stronger resolve. Again, because it's the higher guidance, if you want to call it that, coming from within you, right? It's a part of you saying this to you. Uh, it's not me saying it to you. It's it, I'm just you know interpreting the telegram from symbol into English, and I don't even know what it means because I don't know anything about typically um, the detailed personal life of of the person I'm working with. <clears throat> So your dreams will typically fire up and people will say, well, oh, yeah, I do remember my dreams, <clears throat> but I've never known how to read them. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of other people say, yeah, I never have dreams. I don't dream. I don't dream. Or they say, you know, I, I do dream, but I never remember them. I never remember them. And then all of a sudden, in like day three or four of like the seven day healing program that I do, all of a sudden, voila, magically, um, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. They come back to me and this is this dream. And I'm like, okay, what is it? And sometimes it's a fragment, and sometimes it's like this seven novel epic saga. <laughs> and all of that's okay. All of that's okay, right? Um, <clears throat> and so the reason I'm bringing up dreams is that when a person is closed off from the sacred, just locked up, and it, it does happen, it's okay, right? You, you live in a kind of, um, as my friend from, uh, friend in, Paris has described you live in a in a in a cultural model where everything's like Cartesian, right? Cartesian, uh, as opposed to what I would call mythopoetic. And the Cartesian, you know, obviously the sort of viewpoint is that the world is dead, we're the only living things, and even we're kind of mechanical. Everything's a clockwork, automatic clockwork. Uh, there's nothing divine, there's nothing sacred, nothing's alive. Everything is like everything's just dead matter. Um, and um, and that's it. Let's just get on with it, <laughs> right? As opposed to the mythopoetic view, which is, you know, if we're alive, then we come out of the earth and the universe, so everything must be alive, right? It just doesn't make sense. Everything is alive, and if we have meaning, we have dreams, we read books, we see signs, we see pandemics like raging across the horizon of our world. Um, you can call it a mechanical, dead, lifeless thing, or you can look at it through a different lens, a mythopoetic lens, and start to see the meaning in some of these things happening. Um, and we're not gonna get into the global <clears throat> meaning here, but um, even in your personal life, even in your personal life. And so mythopoetic is basically to say, we're gonna open ourselves to um, the suggestion that there are patterns that are discernible in our world and within us. And if there are patterns that are discernible, that are intelligible to us, right, that the counterparty that's presenting this pattern could be just nature or whatever, right? If we see meaning in it, then the meaning uh, is not automatically invalid. Right? And with that, with those starting blocks, you can you can you can go a long way. So when a person is like locked off from all of that, it's like, I don't meditate, I don't wanna sit around and like do this online session with this long haired guy singing Kumbaya. <laughs> right, I don't wanna do any of that. Um, but when the other side is trying to get a message to you, right, and it's typically it's those kind of people that, um, I mean, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but there are, there are other, fact patterns of a person who's like hardcore closed off to this stuff um, that, you know, as implied by these furrowed brows will like spill over into other aspects of their life. You know, just leave it at that. What will happen is that uh, 
they are the people who will often have the most vivid dreams. Because when you close yourself off to the sacred in every realm, one of the last resorts for the sacred to get message to you is when you are asleep. Right? When you are asleep, you are in a zone of no fear, no threat, and no control. I mean, you're out. Right? Presumably, if you allowed yourself to fall asleep, your door's locked, the alarm system's on, you're, it, you're, it's safe, uh, you trust everyone in the home with you. Um, you may have a storm raging inside of you that, that wakes you up at three in the morning. Um, but that's separate. Right? You still have to sleep. So you sleep, you're devoid of fear, threat, and control. Um, and within that, the sacred you know, kind of antenna dish opens. And if there's a big backlog of guidance that's trying to get to you, you will have massive dreams, massive dreams. Uh, and the problem with our profane world is that there are no, you know, very few resources to help people actually kind of understand their dreams. Um, so there's, there's two ideas here uh, I'm trying to kind of put across here. One is that um, even if you don't know how to get into the sacred or you feel like you're bad at it, you are dipping into the sacred all throughout the day. Uh, you just don't have the vocabulary to call it that. So when you are sleeping a full one third of your life, you're basically in a realm of the sacred. Right, the messages you get for the dreams and all that stuff, it, it's not usable because you, 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 you aren't, we've lost the playbooks, the Rosetta Stones for translating that into sort of usable stuff when we wake up and step back into the profane world, but it's there. So right off the bat, you know, sleep eight hours a day, a third of your days is basically spent in the sacred. Um, and then <clears throat> in the exercise below, we'll talk about other ways of picking up when you are in the sacred by accident, a kind of drive-by sacred um, uh, dips into the sacred throughout the day. Um, but for now, one of the biggest areas where people are um, uh, typically in the sacred is when you're dreaming, is when you're sleeping and dreaming. And so what I, what I wanna do for the rest of this sort of topic section is I wanna give you a little bit of guidance <clears throat> on how to read dreams, and, and which is a, a, a huge topic. Um, but it does relate to the sacred in the way that I've just explained. And also, when I say, you know, when I help people move into a healing cycle um, and people's dreams fire up, right, a healing slash transformation cycle, with the pandemic, Right, a good chunk of the world is being forced into pressure and containment and transformation slash healing. And because of that, uh, I know from the emails I'm getting from my community all around the world that uh, people's dreams are firing up <laughs> big time, right? Big time. Uh, <clears throat> and I can't read everyone's dreams individually. That's like that. So, uh, uh, there's too many people uh, here, right? But this is actually part of what I do as, as like a healer or kind of person. Um, so in this sacred space, I want to uh, acknowledge the surge in dreams as a thing, as you go into transformation from caterpillar into cocoon, okay? It's a real valid thing, and I want to give you some tools here for you to nav navigate that world uh, on your own here. And when I say dreams, dreams when you're asleep, uh, more subtly and difficult to uh, kind of pick up often, uh, ironically, even though you're awake, uh, are daydreams, uh, waking visions, fantasies, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit after. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the quick kind of guidance on how to read dreams. Um, so when I read a dream for someone uh, generally, I'll, you know, my weekly sort of private advising session for the, for the people I'm doing healing with. I'll give you my two cents, but then you are the ultimate knower of what the dream means, right? You are the authority, not me. Uh, so when I read a dream for you, if we disagree on any points, you are always correct. Um, 
process wise, I'm just throwing stuff at you to like, I'm like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks, looking at like the crystal from different angles. Um, but you are the one in the driver's seat, right? So if we were playing golf, you are the golfer, I'm the caddy, right? I'm like, well, hole nine, it breaks a little hard to the left. You gotta be careful, but I'm not swinging the club. You're swinging the club, the scorecard's yours. Uh, and then, you know, you tip me at the end. I don't tip you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> When something feels like it clicks, um, and you say, oh, wow, that's it, right? It's just this flash of like, it's obvious, that's it. Then that is usually the sign that that's the right interpretation, right? That's why if I disagree with you, it's like, it doesn't matter what I think. Because a dream is almost one of the most intimate forms of communication between a part of your inner self and you. And it's not for me or anybody else to like get in the middle of that. Like, so if you have this telegram of a dream and you're like, uh, you know, I, I get, she's trying to tell me something, will you help? Uh, I typically won't ask your background or, you know, sort of life details or whatever. I don't want to know. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to know. Right. I'm not, I'm not a therapist. Right. So I'll take the dream and I'll like translate the symbol into like English, explain the physics <clears throat> and I'll do a demo. Right. And then I hand it back to you and I'm like, so that's kind of what I made of it. Uh, and then how that applies to your real life, I, I don't know. You, you, can, you can read the telegram and then you can throw it away, burn it. <laughs> Mark is spam because you don't want to hear the message. Uh, <clears throat> or you can say, um, crap, okay, I, I need to, I, there's some things I need to think about. And it's like, that's great. That's for you. Like you retain your own sovereignty at every step of the process, which is critical. Because um, if you don't, Build those muscles and you're just reliant on me or anybody else and what's what's the point right what's the point and then the last point in um <clears throat> dream kind of absorbing dreams is this idea of um so when you read a dream the basic rule of thumb for reading a dream is that every actor in the dream is taken as a different part of your own inner self So if you meet a friend, right, it's not actually the friend, but the friend as a symbol of a part of you, symbolized by your friend because of how you think of him, right? Your dream will grab the friend as a symbol, as an at-hand symbol from like current events. Um, <clears throat> in the process of trying to put together this diorama to like say something to you internally, right? So if you see, um, let's say, uh, you know, you see your ex and your ex is a guy. And in the dream, your ex says something to you. That's not your ex, actually. If your real life ex needs to say that, he'll just say that. But the inner ex is a symbol of typically your inner masculine, a part of your own inner self, saying something to you. Okay, or doing something to you, offering something, running away, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, Colors, rooms, feelings, landscapes, these are all part of the com communication. When you see it like that, it is, um, you know, it, it, it is a very kind of, like any fairy tale or myth, it's inexhaustible. <clears throat> um, any symbol, like any symbol or pattern, it is pretty inexhaustible. The sort of caterpillar, cocoon, butterfly symbol or, or archetype or pattern is inexhaustible. We could talk for hours on the different sort of physics and sort of angles of that. <clears throat> and every dream will present itself as a, as a whole sort of object, an artifact that can be read in that manner. Uh, <clears throat> people will often ask, well, why doesn't the dream just send me an email? Why doesn't it just like tell me in words? And the answer is sometimes it does, but even the words will be gobbledygook. And the reason for that is that um, the part of you that dreams comes from a very old place uh, in us. And you can say it uh, biophysically, you could say it metaphorically. Uh, it is a pre-literate part of our wiring, right? Even the Neanderthals dreamed, even Cro-Magnon man and woman dreamed, right? Uh, before they, they were literate. So the language that's used is symbolic. Right. That is the base source code of uh, human, even superhuman communication 
um, is symbolic language, is symbolic language. Okay. Uh, I do always recommend, especially in times like this, keeping a dream journal. Um, it's just a <clears throat> little notebook like this uh, by the bed. And um, what I recommend on retreat when uh, I'm helping people with their dreams, I'll say, keep it by the bed. Um, like this guy has a little like, pen that I just keep there. And when you're picking up sort of details and you're actually able to wake up and remember, keep the light off. Once the blue light hits you, everything evaporates. Um, and ideally you write in the dark, so you lose as, as little as possible the detail. And so the notebook I use is small because I can write in the dark one line and then flip it without the risk of overwriting. Um, so anyway, these things, when you keep a dream journal, often if you have recurring dreams, it's like the dream side hitting the send button over and over because it hasn't gotten a read receipt. You, you haven't had the click of like, oh crap, this is what this means. So people will have dreams that have been recurring for 30 years and they'll bring it to me or somebody like me. They'll finally get the reading they'll click, and then the dream will stop recurring. Like it'll stop on a dime. Uh, I'll probably give you a break for three or four days <laughs> as they like change the set on the stage and everything, like change the costumes of the actors. And then, um, and then the dreams will fire up again, but it will be these elaborate, you know, the, the image is always like they're down there banging on a pipe with a rock, SOS, 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 for like 20, 30 years. And when you finally hear it and you bang back, the SOS stops and they're like, we're saved, we're saved, they found us. And then they start banging back, but they don't bang back SOS anymore. They're like, okay, we've got three guys down here, they're injured, we need a medevac, we need food, um, you know, shoot the internet service down here, we need like batteries for our phones, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the feeling of it. <clears throat> Okay, so that's my pitch for like, at least um, not completely dismissing your dreams out of hand, okay? And um, what I would say here is that uh, I'll give you a couple of classic patterns and, and kind of what they typically translate into. Um, and then if you want, we can do an actual kind of demo uh, if you're interested. You can say in the chat or, or whatever. Um, I'll just kind of go with the flow. Some of the classic patterns you see in beginning dreams, like people who are, don't really listen to their dreams, but they just start getting them and they, they notice some patterns. Um, number one is being chased. All right, well, we live in the profane, so um, number one is I'm being chased, uh, I'm being mugged, it's a boogeyman, it's a robber, I'm, in, I'm at home and I've, I've got a gun and they're like breaking in through the windows. Um, uh, I'm driving and someone's chasing me in a car. And, and typically, you know, intruder, thief, boogeyman, zombie. Uh, when you read that really quickly, you basically take everything in the dream as a symbol of a different part of your own inner self. So there the simple sort of translation would be, um, that there is a part of you that is trying to get to you. Uh, it's tried a lot of different ways by that point, typically, right? It's come to you in waking, thoughts that you have that you stuff down, desires that you have that you stuff down, that you're forced to stuff down to keep your mask on. And then it can't come to you, you, you shut it off. So it has to come to you in the only other sacred channel there is when it's sleeping, when you're sleeping. Um, and even when you sleep, it comes to you, you stuff it down. You like ignore it, you say dreams are just like neurons firing, which you know nobody knows that, right? They just presume. Um, you may take sleeping pills to like nuke whatever is happening down there just to shut it up, right? Um, <clears throat> meditation, people will often say, well, you know, I need to meditate. Um, and I'm like, great, and I teach them some meditation. Uh, and everything quiets down after a while. But after three weeks, they come back and like meditation isn't working anymore. It's like, what do you mean? When you sit, you're not able to like sit. And then that's when they disclose that they were using meditation to basically get themselves to sleep. Um, and after three weeks, like the powers that be within you are like, okay, this is not like true meditation. They're just trying to use meditation as another sleeping pill tranquilizer dart to like shut us up. And it, you know, 
we're slow. It takes us about three weeks to be wise to your tricks. <laughs> but if you use meditation in that profane way to control, as opposed to open yourself to message, right, then it's not going to work anymore. Um, because, uh, yeah, so, so meditation will stop working right after three weeks, and then we'll have like a separate kind of conversation. Um, so here, typically, there is a suppressed part of you and valid part of you that is this thing coming back in transformation, right? And when you push it away, it keeps coming. It comes to you in dreams, you push the dream away. And if you were this part of you, what would you do? How would you escalate gradually, gently? Because you don't want to hurt anything because it's, it's you too. I mean, this house is mine too. If I burn it down, I have no place to live either. Right, but you're not listening to me. So how do I get to you? And often, <clears throat> what will happen is um, I come to you during the day, you dismiss me. I come to you in dreams, you dismiss me. My only final recourse is to start pulling the theater drop dramatic levers of fear. Right. So that I will present now, not as your brother coming to you to talk to you, but as this like boogeyman chasing you. Um, and you'll be afraid that I'm gonna shoot you or stab you or something else. And then you finally wake up in a cold sweat in three in the morning. And I'm like, okay, now, I'm sorry I had to do it like that, but now I've got your attention. And when you wake up at three in the morning, still worrying that the guy's in your house, you magically have remembered your dream. <laughs> right, this is not me doing. This is like a pattern that you've seen thousands upon thousands of people. There is a counterparty within you where its incentives are completely aligned with you. If, if you die, like it dies too, right? But you're not listening. And it's like, how do I like how do I get him or her to listen without like burning the whole house down? Um, and it, it is this sort of, you know, pressure cooker of a thing and transformations, pressure and containment force you in the container with this thing you're running away from until you finally turn around and start talking to it and come to some kind of reconciliation, right? And the first step of that is to realize this thing chasing you is not a demon. It's not the devil. It is a part of you that you have disavowed and disowned. Far from being the devil, there are great thinkers in the world who have described it as it's not the devil, it's Christ and your Peter before the crucifixion, right? Denying you know the guy, right? Uh, like, what is it, three times before the third crock, for, before the third cock crows for the morning. Right? You're like, no, no, it's the devil. I, 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 I should kill it. It's, it's ideologically incorrect. And the thinkers that talk about this stuff are like, no, it's the opposite. This is like the best part of you. This is the most powerful part of you coming in this guise of intruder to scare you, to wake you up so that you remember the stinking dream. Um, and you know it's the most powerful part of you because if you're soaked in the world of the profane and everyone's trying to put a gun to your head to get you to put this mask on of the good girl or the strong, silent, you know, obedient guy, what part of you would they fear the most? Obviously, there will be the part of you that is the spark of the divine, the thing that makes you special, the thing that makes you different from everybody else, that gives you this unique gift to the world. Right? The profane has no place for that. Everything's cookie cutter because everything's driven by fear. So the thing that you are taught to stuff down ironically ends up at the end of the saga becoming the thing that is not the equal, but the first among equals, the, the highest part of you, the best part of you. Um, you know, in all the sort of classic scenes, the, the thing that you thought was your biggest vice ends up being your biggest virtue. Um, and then other ways of describing the physics, other aspects of the physics are that when they say, when you know I teach bliss and we talk about finding your bliss in life and your true meaning and purpose, that, you know, out of your deepest wound will come your greatest gift to the world. Okay, all of these things relate to the physics of this. Um, 
So to reconcile this, you would use various healing techniques to get to the bottom of like what it is you've like pushed away and how do you sort of bring it back and what compromise, what reconciliation you can come to. And um, I don't know if we'll have time to do a full demo with like uh, a fairy tale. Um, I think we'll skip that for now. Um, but if people are interested, you know, uh, fairy tales are basically collective dreams that have stood the test of time. And, um, and you can read fairy tales as dreams as well. Uh, and when you read them and they are these kind of <clears throat> um, global patterns across humankind. I mean, the, the pattern of caterpillar, cocoon, butterfly is itself a kind of fairy tale, right? Um, the first fairy tale I typically tell to teach this stuff is called uh, The Frog King, Grim Brothers number one, like Princess and the Frog, basically, with the Disneyfied, the Disneyified version. Um, and you can read that as uh, a dream. And the meaning that comes from it is completely different from the typical profane meaning, uh, where, you know, the Princess and the Frog, right? It's like when mothers read this story to their daughters, they're like, well, so the moral is, dear, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find Prince Charming, right? <laughs> And that's valid, right? That's valid as a profane sort of how do I get my stuff done in the profane world, but in the sacred world, there's a completely different sort of meaning. Um, so maybe we'll do that in a future session uh, if people are interested. Um, so, so basically, what I want to say is um, uh, your dreams will likely be firing up at this point. I would note them down. Um, you can find someone like me or you know, someone like me or someone like me uh, to sort of help read them if that would be helpful. You can read them yourself, certainly, and accrue your own kind of inner shared vocabulary of like what different things mean. And then the last thing I'll say about this is that daydreams also count. Uh, daydreams, waking visions, or what some people uh, typically in a derogatory way called fantasy, right? When you, when you sort of start fantasizing about things in the middle of the day, those fully count as dreams too. Um, and people will say, well, that's just a fantasy. And, you know, in the profane world, it's like everyone disregards fantasy, but fantasy is a way of higher guidance coming to you, putting ideas, patterns, visions, images in your head that then turn into action in the profane. And, what I mean by that is, let me put it this way, everything great and even the not great things, but everything powerful and grand um, and grandiose in the profane world starts in the sacred, okay? And to wit, everything we see in the world, every vaccine, the Eiffel Tower, the Golden Gate Bridge, um, sort of all these great things in it, the very idea of democracy, right? The very idea of, um, uh, you know, medicine, uh, medical discovery, scientific discoveries, all of these things we cherish and celebrate in the world of the profane started as a fantasy in somebody's head, okay? So the root of everything starts in fantasy, in guidance and flashes of intuition, insight. Uh, we typically shush, shush, don't talk about that. But then they come out and it's like, whoa, look at that guy. Where, do, where does he play? How does he play music like that? How does he speak like that? He's so inspired, right? She's incredible, right? How does she like sort of move and dance and inspire other people like that? All of that comes from the sacred. Right? But in the profane world, we're afraid to talk about that because it's a realm we have no control over. And so we fear it and we feel threatened by it, and we seek to control it. Um, so anyway, long story short, dreams matter, write your dreams down. <laughs> and when you get dreams in the waking, in, in waking time, uh, don't dismiss those um, either. Right? Do not dismiss the power of fantasy or dreams. You don't have to talk about them with other people, but you can take your own inner guidance from them and then move out in the world from there. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to say uh, on that topic. So as we continue to travel together through this storm, 
as you continue to be in a state of pressure and containment, which then trip falls you into transformation. Typically, your dreams and fantasies will fire up, right? And, and the rain is like becoming more powerful as I say this, right? And hopefully what I've just explained about how to read dreams and even fantasy will be of some practical utility and, and comfort for you. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on. We've got a couple of questions here, uh, and then uh, we'll move to the kind of suggested exercise for when we, when we close. Okay, so here we have a question. Hey, Arity, I, I'm afraid of not knowing uh, how to live in a world where the structures, the things on which I base my security, I've known all my life, are no longer there. My investments disappear. My job is gone. I have no income. I'm dependent on the system, electricity, water, sewage, but I can't pay for it. Right? I need food, but I can't buy it. I'm a bit nervous about how I fit <clears throat> into the future system. So first I wanna say um, thank you for asking that very brave uh, and excellent question, okay? Um, the way I think about this and what came to me when I was sitting with your question is that the, the quick answer is that there will be a new structure. Uh, there won't be no structure. Right, because we're all we're all still here together, and we created the last structure, and we will create, you know, the new next structure. Um, like whether that structure, new structure, will be much more online with different kinds of government programs to sort of bridge people through, help, um, and all this stuff. Right. I mean, there will be a new structure. We are sort of, even now, we can say the structure we're in is the new structure. It, it's still in the midst of transformation, but even in it's half-baked form, we are in a new structure. And you will have a place in it, okay? But right now, that place is unclear, right? So we are in the midst of transformation. Now, in the midst of that transformation and lack of clarity for all of us, right, in terms of where we fit into the new structure, and note that I say lack of clarity. And the, one of the things we get in the realm of the sacred when you go in is you get clarity of vision. Um, there's a profane level of looking at your place in the new structure and a sacred level of look, and both are valid, both are necessary, okay? The profane level of where you fit, where any of us fit in the new structure is all the profane sort of things driven by fear, threat, control, uh, perfectly valid. Like, how am I gonna get food? How am I going to get money? Do I need to borrow money? Do I need to trade? Do I need to call on relatives? Uh, all that stuff you already know, all that stuff you're already cycling through, figuring out how you make your way uh, through the world in this new structure. And even the structure right now is changing. Okay. And when the new structures kind of form and kind of cool, it's like magma. It will cool over time. It will start to solidify then you will find a new place to slot yourself into, okay? And, and that's fine. So I'm describing what you already know. This will happen, um, and uh, you will get through, right? We will all get through. So that's at the profane level. And then at the sacred level, one of the things that is... Um, very powerful about moving into a new structural framework in a time like this is that at the sacred level when all the past structures uh, it's not that they're all falling apart right the food supply is still intact people still like you know money uh, all this stuff is still working right but but i i understand your feeling right so when things start shifting around and your role before is unclear what happens in pressure and containment, as we've said uh, in the last session, is our masks will start to fall off. And <clears throat> the mask of, if you were a banker, your banker mask will start to fall off. If you were a baker, your baker mask will start to fall off because we're going through this transformative period of pressure and containment, fine. What happens when your mask falls off is all these things that were held back by your mask, that were hidden and, and you know, 
covered from the world by your mask are revealed are revealed and the thing that is in you already will in one form or another become unleashed and start moving through the world okay and at that point and this in many ways is the crux of transformation you will need to make some decisions about how you how you react to that how you regard that <clears throat> um these sessions online where people ask me questions even about my own stuff and I start talking about a little bit about my own background, which is not something I do, right? That is sort of the mask of the sort of, you know, sort of professional business -y, transactional healer coming off and I'm talking about my own stuff more and more as a small example. <clears throat> but as our masks come off, more and more of these aspects of this, often these are the things that we're chasing us in our dreams. Saying, look, we need to, we need to talk about how we coordinate because I'm not, I'm not hiding in the closet anymore. I'm coming out, uh, and I don't want to mess up your nice little system, but I'm not hiding anymore. So you either talk to me, or I come out, I break a bunch of glass, and then you talk to me. Uh, but one way or another, we have to talk, <laughs> right? So at the sacred level, as your mask comes off, there will be these elements of you that come out, <clears throat> and the idea here is that. You are not just the profanum. You have the templum inside you as well, right? And the way these things work is that the temple is established first, and then the marketplace springs up around it, right? The priests don't go around looking for a marketplace to put their temple in the middle of, no, right? Obviously, that would be absurd. It doesn't work like that. The temple is established first. They have guidance, they do their readings, they look at the geography, and they pick the right sacred spot. They put the cornerstone there, the temple goes up, and then the marketplace, right, all the fortune tellers and souvenir sellers uh, spring up around it. The templum, the sacred, establishes first, and the profane then grows up around it. Now, for most of us, we were bankers before and afterwards, we're just gonna put the same mask on and get on with it. You, if you were a banker, you're gonna go back to banker. If you were a baker, you're gonna go be back to being a baker. Maybe something will move a little bit, but for the most part, you're like, oh, that was a hellish three months. Glad that's over, let's hit the bar. Let's like keep rolling as we were. Most people are gonna be like that, that's okay, right? No judgment, no whatever. That's, I'm just describing the phenomenon, right? That's what most people will, will, will do. But for a few of us, there will be things in us that were suppressed and hidden in the old structure that will now be breaking free, right? And when the mask comes off, this deeper part of you will be unleashed and you will not be able to get it back in, right? The lid of the pot is out and it's, it's gone, right? And you can't, you, you can't bring all that back in. And honestly, <coughs> you don't want to, you don't want to. In the language of the diff some of the different things I teach, when I teach you know people how to sort of find and follow their bliss, there is this concept called um, in Chinese called ziran, which is the uh, the Chinese word for nature. Uh, so I'll just write this. Um, and in another disclosure, you'll see how bad my handwriting is. Right, ziran. So it's not show. It's backwards. Sorry. That's backwards. So it's Ziran. Maybe you can see it through the paper. <laughs> Ziran. Uh, Ziran in pinyin. Okay, that, that's backwards. Okay, but you you get the you get the general idea. So, and the idea is that this is the Chinese word for nature, but the words Ziran means Zi means self, and Ran means as it is. Voila. All right, so self, voila. And what that means is that, and the reason we use that word to describe nature, I mean, when we say nature, we say tziran. Tziran is our word for nature. And so when you call nature by this name, what you're basically saying is that nature is the world where 
the thing, or it could be the oneness or just things in general, just blah as they are. The tree grows however it grows, um, and um, you know the river flows however it flows, and you can go in and mess with it, right? But at this sort of very high level, even you are a Zeran expression of the world. And so you going to mess with it, I mean, in, in the sense there is nothing artificial or human made because humans are a part of nature. So whatever we do, when I build the Eiffel Tower, it's no different than bees building a beehive. Okay. So the idea here is that um, there is this normal kind of pre-existing flow within you like the lines of grain in wood, okay? Like the flow of a river, your inner zuran. And this is the thing that informs what you do. This is the thing that is trimmed and cut off when someone forces a mask on you. And this is the thing in pressure and containment. By the way, the cutoff parts of the river are the parts that are chasing you when you have boogeyman dreams, right? And at a high level, you want them back, but the cost of bringing them back in terms of the mask will be high. That's why you fear it. But it doesn't mean they're invalid. So when the mask comes off, these are the things that come rushing out of you. In the image of the caterpillar cocoon butterfly, the tzuran that's returning is the wings of the butterfly, the power of flight, right? And, and the caterpillar acquires the power of flight, not because it's cool to fly, or not because its friends told it, hey, you should, you should fly, it'll be cool. Um, but because of the hidden zuran, right, of the butterfly, and the hidden zuran of the caterpillar is to fly. So it's just like what we're saying about a girl's first menses. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not, it is happening, right? And you can vilify it as disgusting, you can celebrate it as like wonderful and glorious, it is still gonna happen. So this caterpillar growing its wings, right, by dying, literally, it's painful. Uh, people will ask it, well, how are you going to make money flying, right? How do you eat flying um, or sculpting or playing music? None of that matters, right? When you follow the priority of the sacred, the templum, we say the direction of the templum is that we will fly. Uh, and then the profanum is just going to have to adjust, right, to suit it. Uh, and I'm sorry, right, this, this is happening. Right? It's like, oh, so it's we're not we're, we're not the caterpillar anymore, we're the butterfly. And all the souvenir uh, sort of sellers and the profanum are all you know going on strike and complaining because because I just invested in this inventory of caterpillar, like you know, sort of souvenirs. <laughs> right? And it's like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The profanum is just gonna have to adjust. Right? You're gonna find another temple. Right? The temple has changed, the direction of the sacred has come in. And now we're moving everything 90 degrees to the left and everything's just gonna have to follow. Now with a mask, you can force that to stop. You can say, no, 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 I don't, I, I'm, I'm not artistic. I'm just a banker. I'm just, you know, I just like to follow the straight and narrow. I don't wanna sort of be involved with any of that. You can do that. And some people arguably are successfully, are successful at doing that till they die at the ripe old age of 90. But I would argue, and here, you know, I'm biased, right? I'm not a therapist, I'm not just here holding neutral space. I am a biased, shameless advocate of the sacred, right? And when I talk about this stuff, my argument is, even if you live to the ripe old age of 90, right, healthy, hearty, and hale, with all your grandchildren all around you as you die, there is still gonna be this part of you that says, if this full expression of my tzuran was not fulfilled, even though I lived to 90, I still feel like I lived half a life. Now, that's not a threat because I believe you get another golden thread in the next life to try again. So it's fine. Um, but even in the next life, right, it won't be this life. It won't be this life. There are pleasures now. Uh, that are fleeting and you know if you see them I'm like why not grab them <laughs> why not grab them um, 
so, you know, when I teach Bliss, we talk about all this. Uh, and I, I know that some of you are in the Bliss program now. You are deep in the thick of it right now. Right? You started this process and then all this stuff hit. And ironically, shockingly, it has accelerated your Bliss process because of these physics that we're describing. Uh, and your, your timing is, you know, impeccable. Um, so those are my thoughts on that, on that, um, question. The profane, it's like, you know, you're here the way you're describing it. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I know you're worried, but you say all these things and then you're like, I'm a bit nervous. And I'm like, well, if, if that were me, I'd be like freaking out. <laughs> so I have a suspicion that you, you kind of have things, you know, somewhat under control and i think that um uh so there's there's definitely a profane level at which to like prosecute and deal with all this stuff uh and you know for most people who are sort of in the circle like you you got this right you got this uh but then there's this sacred level uh which is this deeper question of like when this whole thing passes and it will, and the dust settles and it will, right? Do you just reflexively put your old mask back on and get on with it? Or are you like, do you take a moment of pause and you're like, hang on a minute, right? And with all the time you've spent in the sacred, you kind of put together the patchwork of images and guidance you've gotten to put together you know, a new kind of pattern, right? Cal Caterpillar is the old pattern. Butterfly, whatever that is for you, is the new pattern. And basically, you're kind of moving in that direction, but it can abort and go back. Where you're like, no, 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 I'm just gonna, I'm still a caterpillar. It's no problem. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Right now, and I want to say in sacred space, if you choose to do that, that's okay. Right, but you do have a choice. You do have a choice. Okay. All right, so that's uh, my answer to that question. Thank you. Um, is Zuran comparable with Dharma? It, it, it's hard to, so this question of, is Zuran comparable to Dharma? Um, uh, the short answer is no. The short answer is no, especially not the way we use the word um, in Western Buddhist circles, where it's like, when I say the Dharma or Sangha, I'm like, saying it in this kind of feeling right and then a monk will say who me no no I'm, I'm not saying that at all right but it's like um it's just i i would check on the nature of the quality of the sacred uh and in this question around language of the sacred i'll, I'll address that more um but there's a whole history of how zen moved you know from india through china to japan uh, to the West, and um, it's just, it's it's become very, I mean, become, it's like from the 70s onward, right? It's become this very Protestant, very Protestant phenomenon in the West, uh, where there's a lot of kind of threat uh, associated with doing it the right way or else, doing it, being mindful or else. Um, so anyway, that's, so I would say the way I use Zoran, Totally different. It's just just treat it as a different system, and it's like it'll be. Uh, we'll all have a little less heartburn. Over it. <laughs> okay. So this next question: How do I know who or what is the real me without masks? Uh, okay, you all ask really good questions. So um, let me try to answer this. Um, so I'll give you a quick, very short, very short sort of mystical answer because you you've, you're asking it in good faith and I want I don't want to dismiss or stuff that part of it down right this mask is coming off I'll, if you're asking it I'll like talk about it and then I'll give you kind of the the slightly less mystical answer that is more usable and practical when you go back out into the profane so the mystical answer of like how do I know what is the real me? How do I know? Well, what's the sign that I know that I've hit the real me after I've taken all these masks off? In one of the meditation programs I teach, um, I teach this exercise called persona. Uh, the word person um, comes from the Latin persona. So per, through, sona, sound. 
So persona was the mask that actors wore on stage with the fluted megaphone mouths to amplify their voices to the back rows of the, uh, of the theater. So when I say I'm a person, I'm saying I'm the person, I'm not saying the real me, I'm saying my persona, my mask. So I have a healer persona and in marketing, we talk about persona all the time. And so in this exercise that I teach in one of these programs where we go very deep, right? In the exercise, you're literally taking off mask after mask after mask. And you know the, the, the mystical answer, would be, who is the real you without masks? If you do that and you, know, you practice and you kind of explore it yourself, what you'll find is that like everything you think is a mask that can be taken off. So that even you as a human, that's a mask. The fact that you're a living being is a mask. The fact that you're even a thing, right, is a mask. The fact that you're even a thing that exists is a mask. And so um, in the end, there's going to be one thing left, uh, which is not a mask. Um, and you won't be able to even think it as a thing, right? You just viscerally will have the feeling of like, there's no more masks. I'm like grabbing at the last mask and I'm like, just, I'm grabbing at nothing. Uh, and yet I can observe myself grabbing. Okay. Um, so in the actual practice, when you hit that, people uh, sometimes become uncomfortable and they like pull the ballast tanks and they come back up and they're like, I didn't like that. And I'm like, that's fine. Don't do it. If you don't like it, don't do it. And other people go down, they take the last mask off and they're just like, um, and there are no really words for it because if I could put a word on it, it would be a mask and you can take it off. But that's my description of what, you know, so how do I know it's the real me? It, that's what it feels like. If I mean, there are multiple ways, but in the mask exercise way, that's what you would do. Um, so that last part is the real you. It's not a very functional answer. You can't, you're not gonna go out in the profanum and uh, buy any goats with that answer. <laughs> um, but uh, I will give you, uh, so there have been gorgeous, elegant descriptions of this state uh, by others. Uh, Shankara, um, the sort of uh, eighth century Indian saint, um, in one of his kind of footnotes, like commentary on, on the Kena Upanishad, described this beautifully. And um, I was talking to my editor, uh, Gauri, last night, who was in Bangalore, who is of the clan of Shankara in India. So I'm very proud that you know I'm associated with someone uh, on earth because uh, I'm not of that exalted class. I'm just a lowly merchant a scholar of my class. <laughs> uh, but Gary will tell you more. But in this footnote to the Kena Upanishad, uh, Shankara commented that the one that knows this thing that I would call like the last thing that has no mask, uh, and the way you, you feel it, right, is with, you can use Shankara's description, which is, uh, the one that knows is never itself the object of knowing, just as fire doesn't illumine itself. Okay. So the real you behind all the masks is the one that knows or perceives and itself is not able to be perceived. You keep grabbing at the thing that is perceiving. It's not even you, not even a thing, not even a human. Um, and the physics of how that happens, and this is the beauty of his footnote, is that and, and it's not, no, it's exact the same as when fire doesn't burn itself or illumine itself, right? Fire can't burn itself, it is the burning. So it's just, and you go, oh, that's so intellectually. No, it's just, you just look at fire. It's like, I've got lights on. I, you know, I made eggs this morning on the stove. Fire is a part of, it, it is this, there's a sacred element of fire and there's the profane element of fire. Uh, but it, it moves ceaselessly, coexists in the sacred and the profane. It's, so when he's explaining this like very deep, like thing that you don't really experience for yourself without, you know, a little bit. Um, 
he can come back out into the praying praying world and say, yeah, it's just like that. You know, like light my lighter that I use to light my cigars, right? It's it's just like that, right? And it is exactly just like that. Um, Which is why, you know, for a guy like me, the Cartesian view of the world is so absurd because it's like the mythopoetics are all around you and it takes a gargantuan effort um, to really ignore it all. Uh, in fact, when I watch the profane ignore it all, that's like, that's the fireworks. Cause it's like, how, how does that even happen? It's like, I grab popcorn and I watch it. Um, so that's like <clears throat> a more mystical answer. And then the less mystical, more useful answer is that, um, <clears throat> and thank you for asking it. Since we're talking about Ziran and the things that come through, that will come through in your dreams, these are things that are arguably still part of your masks that want to express in the world. Okay, so you start taking off your mask of the banker or the baker. And there will be another mask behind that where it's like there will be some flow of your Ziran, of what you actually want to be in this world, you know, uh, irregardless of what other people want you to be. And so you can think of it as like, when you take off all the profane masks, the masks you wear for fear, threat, and control, there will be this collection of sacred masks, the mask you wear uh, out of love, nurturing, and surrender. And then behind that is all the Shankar stuff, right? But, but the more practical answer is these sacred masks. And these sacred masks will follow a form as well. They will follow an archetype. They will follow a kind of pattern like this sort of caterpillar cocoon butterfly pattern. And this, uh, in, when I teach bliss, I call it your mythic form, right? This archetype, this pattern of what you, what character you're supposed to be that you feel naturally sort of resonant with. And you get hints of your mythic form from your dreams. Uh, and also from the outer dreams that you resonate with. That is uh, books, novels, movies, characters that you're like, you know, you always resonate with them. For me, for example, for a long time, it was, um, you know, the, the sort of guide. So I would resonate. So I would watch Star Wars and I wouldn't resonate with Luke. I would resonate with Obi-Wan. Um, I would watch Lord of the Rings and I wouldn't, um, you know, resonate with uh, Aragorn. I would resonate with Gandalf, right? Um, as I increasingly am in pressure and containment and I'm being pushed into this, you know, my own transformations. Um, I'm moving from that pattern of wizard guidance more into kind of this, you know, trickster king archetype is the closest. The, it's, it's come to me in dreams even in the last two days. Uh, so what is a trickster king? A trickster king is like Odysseus, is a king, but also sort of this trickster boundary crosser figure. Uh, Wutan, uh, uh, Odin, right, in, in Nordic. Um, and, uh, you know, the way I track this, even as I'm going through uncomfortable pressure and containment, in the program is I just follow my dreams. And so if you want to know what your archetype you're in right now, uh, just track your dreams for a few weeks right? and it will all be laid bare. Uh, but only if you use the mythopoetic lens to view it and you get all this nourishment by looking at your dreams with, with the view of the sacred. Or with the profane, it's just like, you know, I'm a neuroscientist from Stanford and you know, my work is all in neurochemicals and neurotransmitters, not in dreams. But because it's all related, I think dreams are just, you know, your brain firing at the end of the day and you're like recovering from sleep, clearing out the garbage. And everyone's like, oh, that must be right. And it's like, he has no data on that, right? He has data on this other completely unrelated stuff. And then he makes his like wild ass comments and everyone just kind of takes that because we're in the world of the profane and we just roll with that. Um, and so, you know, it takes a little bit of attention to kind of spot the Cartesian mask that we are all wearing. Uh, and then even after you spot it, you can choose to leave it on, right? Um, but when you feel like it, right, and when you feel safe uh, from the prying eyes of others, you can also choose to take it off and see what you can see in there. I don't know what you're going to see, um, 
But like I said before, uh, you don't have to do it, right? But you do have a choice, right? You do have a choice. Okay, uh, so that's my long-winded answer on uh, this question about masks. Thank you for asking it. And then this last question is, uh, our language as an expression of the sacred slash profane in the last session, I think one listener commented on the use of profane language in sacred space. As a writer, I've maintained there's no such thing as bad words. There are only inartful or profoundly hurtful uses of words. Fuck can be a curse or a kiss. Uh, totally, right? Uh, so language is not profane per se or sacred, but can it be used in sacred or profane uh, words? My question is, in this time of extreme isolation and separation, language is one of the few ways we have left to connect. Uh, for now, for now. What are your thoughts regarding language as an expression of the sacred and of the profane? How can we use and choose our words to reach others who may be in profound states of grief, loneliness, and exhaustion? So the thing that characterizes profane versus sacred is that the profane is a realm of fear, threat, and control. And the sacred is a realm devoid of fear, threat, and control. And when you move those out, the opposites come rushing in, like you know, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So in the absence of fear, threat, and control, you get their opposites, love, nurturing, and surrender. Okay. And so the words that do that in their respective spaces are then words that are used in a profane way um, or a sacred way, right? So even when I use the word fuck, and I apologize for that, you know, but in a sacred space like this, when I'm on retreat or when I do my programs, I kind of try to try to keep it, keep it under control. Um, but when I'm in a space like this, literally in the sacred that we were holding together, my mask comes off. And that's kind of just the way I talk, right? Uh, I'm from New York. I'm a business background. Uh, and, you know, I'm sort of soft and, and sort of you know, sort of comforting and I'm not sort of a, a jerk or whatever, but I still do talk the way I talk, right? So per your example, even with that, right, when I use the word fucking in, in even when I'm talking, I'm typically using it in kind of a role play uh, kind of example where the last time I, I remember using the word was just, I was, dem I was like talking about how your inner protector would talk to someone if they're like, what are you doing with all this sacred stuff, right? And what you would do is you would hold that boundary and then the correct answer to that is like, mind your own fucking business, all right, step off. Uh, either help me with this or like go away and I'll catch you later, right? So that use of the word is kind of like demonstrative as to like how in the profane world we would push back and, and, um, and, and sort of maintain that boundary to protect the sacred realm. Right uh, now, within the sacred, right? Something I would never say is like what, like what the f is wrong with you? I can't even bring myself to say it because it's I, I wouldn't do that emotionally to someone, right? So in the sacred, I wouldn't do that to you. In the profane, in a business meeting, you know, if you're one of my VPs and you just missed your revenue target for the quarter, you know, I may look at you and I may say, "What the f is wrong with you?" <laughs> um, even then, I probably would find better words. Uh, <clears throat> But yeah, so absolutely, I agree with you. And I think um, uh, you know, there are then ways of using words that the physics of which when you deploy them, right, in the sacred, ideally, you will not make them feel under threat, right? which is why I had this sort of slightly kind of allergic reaction when they use the word Dharma and I have all this like, you know, things going on with like Zen centers around the country in the last sort of 10 years. And it's just sort of like, you know, there's a class of, there's a niche of practitioner where it's just, um, even when they say, I want to be mindful and I want to be, you know, grounded and I want to, you know, have meta, and I want you know love and light and everything. Uh, those are beautiful, just lyrical words, um, but in a certain framework with a certain lens of thinking, right? They are sometimes wielded as sort of implicit threats, where it's like we're all being mindful. Why aren't you being mindful? Why aren't you coming to yoga class, right? So it's like this, 
this sort of implied threat. And so that's when it becomes not sacred. And you're like, but it's yoga and I see all these statues. So, you know, even though I don't feel right, I should just go along with the crowd. And there's that word should, and you stuff something down and move forward, right? And the yoga is still great. You still feel great at the end of it, but it is this sort of, you know, blended. It's like you're in the bathtub and, and someone did pour like a cup of coffee in the bath. It's, it's not going to kill you, but it's like, it's not purely sacred anymore. There's this sort of blended little bit of pollution there. And the pollution is not in the words you choose to use. It is in how they're wielded, right? Uh, in order to, in the sacred, ideally, like create no feeling of fear, threat, or control. Right? Um, so words that, you know, are around that are those sort of holding space words. When you do healing with me and you, you get into that sort of Facebook group, right? There's a video before that where I explain sort of the, just some of the, ins and outs of holding space. So using words like, instead of saying, oh, I think it's this, or you should do that, right? You know, not pointing, it's often accompanied with this pointing finger. You say like, I wonder if, right? So you, I'm just wondering on my side, I'm not exerting control on your side. And when you say, um, oh yeah, you know, your grandfather died. I, I had that same thing, my grandfather died too. And it's like, whoa, that's control, right? I'm equating your experience with mine, and it's like I didn't give you, I didn't give you that control. I'm like asserting that control. So instead of saying that, you could say, "Oh, I'm sorry, your your grandparent died." That makes me think of an experience I had. So without saying anything about you're controlling you, I just say, "That makes me think of an experience I had." Right. So you can say things just without the extra onus of control. Um, and anyway, that's a whole sort of larger topic, but but the idea, one of the ways to think about it is to say, um, in the sacred, for me, ideally, with every interaction you have with another person, especially in me, in, in, in this sacred space, I'm like, you know, kind of the ritual elder, as they call it, right? I don't think I'm that old, <laughs> but I'm like the ritual elder. So it's my job to kind of maintain the sacred space. I'm like the referee on the field. Um, so even more for, for, for me, where it's like, the, you know you're maintaining sacred space uh, when you're not instilling fear, when you're not sort of uh, instilling threat uh, or control. But there's one sort of like taste note, like flavor, like a, like a taste note in wine that you wanna really taste for, for me, which is at no point so at every point in sacred space, the sovereignty of the other person must always remain firmly within their own hands. That's the critical thing. That's the critical thing. Right? Where I always say, this is my suggestion, something you can try, only if you want to. And if you don't want to, that's okay. We're gonna say that so much, people like roll their eyes, why, why does he keep saying that? Because at every point, you may have a bully voice in you that says, oh, this guy's great, you need to like do whatever he says. And I need to continually push back on that gently to make sure the, the king or queen's scepter of authority is always resting in your own lap with your hand on it, not clutched, just at your peace and at your ease because you are sovereign. Right. And to maintain this sacred space, I must always make sure that your sovereignty is never taken from you, that is always firmly in your hands. In some cases, people will try to give me their sovereignty. They'll say, well, Artie, why don't you, you're supposed to, why don't you just tell me what to do? Tell me what to do with my relationship. Should I leave them? Should I stay with them? And then, I mean, obviously, right, I'll be like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I can't tell you. Right? And we have this image in our healing programs of like the board of directors. And I'm like, uh, I'm not even on your board, let alone the CEO. I don't have a vote. Uh, I'm not even an observer in your board meetings unless you like show me the minutes <laughs> of the <coughs> of the meeting notes. I'm just the consultant trying to get everyone back in the room together so they can talk to each other. Um, you know, when those off, all these board members start rushing through, and I'm like, well, uh, to the extent that you've hired me to be your boardroom consultant, 
uh, the general recommendation if you want is to let them stay in the room and let them have their day in court and say what they want to say to you. Okay. Um, so sovereignty is always in your hands. And because sovereignty is in your hands, I don't have to pretend to be objective, right? I'm not a therapist holding neutral space. I am an advocate. I am biased. I am biased um, in favor of the sacred, right? Because the world is 99 profane, 1% sacred. So I'm here, my value add is to be sort of this advocate arguer, um, uh, you know, kind of speaking on behalf of the value of the sacred. Um, it's a little bit nuanced, but I hope, you know, I'm not finding the right words, but I hope you, you get the meaning of what I'm trying to say. Um, now there's one last aspect of this sort of language and sacred space, which is, so that's what I, so I gave you my answer for um, how you talk to other people, but the, the last and, and in some ways most important aspect in language and sacred space is in how you use these words when you're talking to your own self, okay? Uh, so in healing, a lot of you in my healing programs, you know that you know the big thing is that you know the, the, the inner bully self that's always threatening you, controlling you, you know, poking you with the cattle prod of fear. Uh, you know, we're in lockdown, but you need to be productive. You still need to be perfect. You, there's, your home still needs to be, um, you know, pristine and spotless, right? And the kids still need to be like on track or even jumping ahead of their peers in terms of homeschooling and everything. And, and the same rules apply, right? Where the idea is that you can be productive. There's nothing wrong with being productive. You can make money, right? There's nothing wrong with continuing to make money. It's the threat that's the issue, right? It's the threat that's the issue. It's the fear, the cattle prodding of fear that's the issue when you use the language on yourself. Okay, uh, when you're in the flow of your bliss, in that river of your zuran, you're very productive, right? Stuff happens on its own. It feels automatic. Uh, you actually have to kind of get used to it, right? The, the luck, the synchronicity of things happening uh, in the live group session um, two days ago on Friday, there's this radiologist, right, who was like, you know, stuff started shifting within him. And then he went to his mailbox one day and he found this check for like all this income that he was owed by the hospital. It's like, it, it, we're in the middle of pandemic, I'm fine, but this will actually cover a year of expenses for me and my family of four in our house, right? And he was shocked, he, he's like written it off. He's like, I'm just gonna, and stuff started shifting within him and the outer world kind of reflected, um, I'm pretty damn near instantaneously, right? And so when you're in the flow of your bliss in the sacred and there's no fear, threat of control and you kind of get it wound up and, and your boat is starting to just like flow in, in the right direction, you're not paddling anymore. The current's taking you, stuff is happening. Like he wasn't fighting, he didn't, there was no lawsuit. The check just kind of appeared, right? Um, and it, it, it's hard to explain to someone who is locked in a Cartesian, the world is dead, um, kind of aspect, but I mean, from the mythopoetic view, it's like, yeah, it totally makes sense that the check showed up. You know, I'm not predicting it. It's just like, just keep the channel open for your guidance of the muse or however you take it. Uh, and then, you know, you do a little quality assurance, make sure she doesn't tell you to like, go jump off a bridge or something, because she won't, right? Uh, and then you kind of keep half an eye out for that kind of stuff, um, which never comes anyway, but you know, why not? Uh, and then just float with it, right? Do what she tells you uh, as much as you can. Uh, and if you're afraid and you don't want to do it, don't wait. She will come back, right? These recurring dreams that happen week in, week out, over 30 years, um, that crashing wave will eventually wear the rock down. <laughs> and hopefully that will happen like in your sort of physical, biological lifetime. Uh, and if not, you know, It'll happen in the next. Um, okay, so this idea of holding space for your own self too, holding space for your own self too, and not threatening you. Okay. Uh, so this is the thing that I would try out, uh, but again, only if you want. All right, so how are we doing on time? Okay, so uh, the last two things I wanna do, so thank you for all those questions. I hope that was helpful. 
Um, the last thing I'll do before the poem is I'll just give you this recommended, suggested uh, sacred space exercise um, for you to try um, uh, when we disperse. And um, this exercise really was inspired by this question two sessions ago. There's a question about how do I help my teens get into sacred space? Uh, they don't want to hear from me. They don't, they're going to roll their eyes at me, but, but I want to help them. I want them to have this tool. So for me, being a dad now actually of two teens, um, myself, right, the way to not do it is to tell them this is good for you. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that, right? Uh, now, there's, there's this larger parenting, technical parenting question of over time, hopefully way before a teen, right, probably around like seven or eight years old, where as a parent, you're going to want to start to transform your relationship uh, with them uh, from being solely their authority to being more and more their advisor. Uh, which the physics are different, everything's different, the setup is different. And that's more of a technical parenting question, and this is kind of not the place to get into that. But the basic sort of answer for teens, right, is really the same answer as I give for adults. How do I get adults into the sacred who are like not interested in it? Which is that you already are in sacred space normally on a daily basis at random parts all throughout the day. When you're in the shower, it ends up being this like pseudo sacred space. When you're running, when you're driving the car alone and you're just like, the car's practically driving itself. And the only thing is we don't have the vocabulary to call it that. And if we can't name it, then we can't enjoy it, right? It's almost like when Someone peels an orange, and you love oranges, and they put it in your mouth, and you're you're playing a game or whatever. You're like, oh, what is that? And you have to look at it and say in your mind, oh, it's an orange. And only after you name it can you fully enjoy it, right? So there are all these like oranges being put in your mouth in the form of a sacred space all throughout the day, but you're not conscious of them, so you don't really sort of stop and go like, oh, the shower is like awesome, maybe I'll take a five minute shower, not a three and a half minute shower, because I want to be in sacred space. I'm getting a download in the shower. It's worth an extra three minutes of hot running water um, to sort of let this thought or image complete. And then I come out running around in a towel trying to write it down. That's totally valid, right? Very few people use their showers like that, but everybody takes a shower every day, right? Uh, I mean, metaphorically. <clears throat> so, so, the exercise here then is to then ask me and ask yourself, when throughout the day uh, are you like that already, right? And so for a teen, it could be uh, in the shower. It could be at certain points during soccer practice, uh, walking to school, driving to school, gaming, vegging out, hanging out with friends, certain friends where I feel no fear, threat, or control. I just fear, I just feel love, nurturing, and surrender, certain friends, not other friends where I'm like stressed out and trying to impress them, right? Um, and say basically the sacred is when you feel this way. Uh, and they'll be like, or you'll be like, oh yeah. And you're like, it's good, right? It's oh yeah, I love that, I love that. Right, and there may be other parts where your teen doesn't want to tell you like this is my sacred space because they don't want you knowing about it because then that's another place you could intrude right um and then you can advise them right on if they want to increase or decrease the percentage of time in the sacred uh how do they do that right how do they do that um oops I'm going to do a quick refresh. Actually, I'm just going to check. Oh, yeah. I'm going to do a quick refresh. Uh, please stand by. Okay. 
Looks like you guys can see me. Okay, great, sorry about that. Not bad, only one freeze. Um, I don't know if you can all see me on Facebook Live. Anyway, okay. Uh, for those of you who commented uh, on the Facebook Live, go ahead and comment, I'll reply uh, after the session. Okay, and so you can advise them and advise yourself on if you want to increase or decrease the percentage of your time in the sacred, an easy way is to take something where you're already on in the sacred and then just elongate it, extend it. Right. So if you want five more minutes in the sacred, you just take a five minute longer shower. If that's where you just automatically go into it, even if, you know, involuntarily, even if I don't want to, I'm stressed, I go in the shower, like boom, I'm in the sacred. Uh, I'm in the zone of no fear, no threat, no control. Okay. Um, if you're just vegging out, if you're playing a certain game, some games you're like really stressed, some games you're, you're just like in the flow, in the flow games is what I'm talking about, okay? So one way is to, so, so the exercise for this week, right, uh, only if you want, is to notice throughout the day when you already go into sacred space automatically, accidentally, really. Uh, and when you do notice it, to like say, oh, this is an orange, this is a piece of chocolate. And you just stop and enjoy the piece of chocolate. And then if you want to elongate it, right? Uh, for your surfers out there, you're just surfing it for a longer ride, right? You're like milking the wave for a longer ride. Longer shower, um, you're driving and you're, you're in the sacred and then, oh, I missed my exit. And instead of going like, dang it, I'm, I'm an idiot. You're like, okay, I get another like, seven minutes in the sacred because I missed my exit <laughs> and the Jeep. And you're like, oh, somebody took my parking spot. Okay, I guess I'll circle around again, right? Because um, when you switch from one mode to another, there's like enjoyments. There are definitely enjoyments to be had in the profane, but there are also enjoyments to be had in the sacred. So um, why would you limit yourself only to one, right? As my daughter, who's 19 now, when she was four, and we would ask her if she wanted chocolate cake or strawberry ice cream for dessert, she would say, both. Can I have both? And we'd be like, oh, uh, I don't know. She's like, so I can have both? I was like, uh, 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 sure, sure. Like, why couldn't you have both, right? Why not have both? So the pleasures of the sacred and the pleasures of the, of the profane, both, and even just jumping back and forth from like moment to moment, all kinds of cool things you can do. So that's the move for this week to try. Well, when you're out in the profane, to notice when you already slip back into the sacred automatically, and then to enjoy it. And if you know ahead of time, right, you can plan ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna like take the long way uh, on my commute to the grocery store today <laughs> uh, to be in the sacred a little longer. So the three moves so far, just to review. Uh, number one is just to withdraw and be in the sacred. Close the door, go for a run, go for a walk attend a talk like this to do it in group. Number two, uh, last week we said to go into sacred period in the middle of an activity, chopping vegetables and a meeting where you're not normally in the sacred, you just like flip into it and see how that feels. And then the third move this week is to see when you already automatically do that reflexively and then just kind of ride that wave. Okay. These are all different ways of feeling how to stretch the envelope a little bit of moving that 1% to 5% to 10%. And there's no risk, fear, or threat. It's like you can move it all the way up to 90% and be like, yeah, it's a little high. I'm going to, I think where I like it is around like 35% sacred, 65 profane. And it's like, that's great. And no, there's no right or wrong answer. And there's no enforcement or threat either. I, I, I have no idea whether you're in a profane or sacred mode right now, but I can't tell. Um, so you have full freedom and sovereignty. Okay, so go ahead and try that out only if you want, no pressure, no threat. But if you do try it, I would love just out of nerdy interest and enthusiasm for you to post your experiences in the question section of next week's session or in the, the comments uh, if you want to, because I would love to hear uh, how it feels for you. Um, if you have experiences with your dreams, you can post those as well. I won't be able to read them, um, 
but if you want to email me your dreams, I can, if you want, direct you to like sort of how to get them read uh, later on as well. Okay. So the last thing I want to do, we're doing okay on time, is I want to read you a poem. I want to read you a poem. This will be a short poem. And we'll do this in the usual way where I read it once with a bit of my color commentary. And then I read it a second time straight. So you, you, you squeeze the juice out of it so we kind of know what's going on. And then we read it once through just so you can experience uh, the poem itself as its own thing. Okay. And this is a poem by um, Robert Bly, one of the great American poets, probably, you know, arguably the best living American poet now. He's in his 90s. Um, and Robert Bly was uh, a close friend. He would perhaps call himself a protege or mentee of um, William Stafford, the poet we read two sessions ago in the first session, the, the poet who talked about the golden thread and the line of elephants and all that. Okay. And as you'll remember, Bill Stafford had this habit of writing morning poems where he wouldn't get out of bed in the morning until he had written a poem. Uh, and uh, Robert Bly being his, uh, being his friend and someone who was very influenced by him. By the way, quick side note on Robert Bly, those of you who have asked me about like initiation and in particular male initiation, Robert Bly, uh, was also the leader of like the, the sort of this men's movement in America in the 90s. And he wrote this book called Iron John, where he reads uh, the Grimm Brothers fairy tale, Iron John, uh, mythopoetically as a dream, um, as I can do in a future session if you want, uh, and takes wisdom out of that sacred sort of guidance space of that fairy tale dream and applies it specifically to the task of male initiation and just like the crisis of men, you know, in the West and in particular in America, um, in our age. Um, but his main thing was he's, he's an American poet. And so what Robert Bly did was inspired by uh, uh, Bill Stafford, I think there was a summer, like three or four month period where he did morning poems too, where he like was in his uh, cabin in I think Montana and he would not get out of bed in the morning until he had written a poem. Uh, and I think a collection of those poems ended up in this volume called Morning Poems by Robert Bly. <laughs> so with that, um, so he was inspired by Bill Stafford and the poem from Morning Poems I wanna read you is a poem entitled what Bill Stafford was like, okay? So sacred space, nested in sacred space, nested in sacred space, uh, through the power of poetry. Um, and he wrote this, of course, this was after Bill had died. He died in 92, um, and this came out in 97. What Bill Stafford was like, with small steps, he climbed very high mountains and offered distinctions to persuasive storms, delicacies at the edge of something larger, a comfort in walking on ground close to water. Um, in dreams, when you see the symbol of water, it's typically a symbol of insight. Uh, a symbol of the deeper submerged, not unexplored, but deeper parts of you uh, from which these insights and powerful beings come out, you know, whales breach and there are sharks in the water, it's dark in the water. And in a dream, you're often afraid to go into the water because you're afraid of the insight that your the side of you is bringing you. And so it's, it, it's just a beautiful line that he you know, offered distinctions to persuasive storms, delicacies at the edge of something larger, this ocean within us, a comfort in walking on ground close to water, where you don't fear the crocodiles are gonna come up and grab you. You're like, you know, they're a part of you and you welcome them in for, you know, a cup of tea. <laughs> something large, 
but it wasn't an animal snorting in a cave, right? This sort of character we're often scared of uh, in our dreams, but more like the rustling of a thousand small winged birds, all together, comfortable in a field feeding. One felt at home nearby. And so, and I know his relationship with Bill Stafford from other sources, it was just this feeling that Bill was able to bring you close to the edge of big, possibly typically scary um, insights and parts of your own inner self through his poetry, through the golden thread image, right? And offer a distinction to that persuasive storm to help you unpack it, to help you understand it so that you would be comfortable being close to that water of your own insight. So that you weren't, you didn't feel like you were going close to this animal snorting in a cave that's gonna come out and rip your head off, but more like the rustling of a thousand small winged birds, all together comfortable in a field, feeding, taking nourishment, spiritual nourishment, emotional nourishment. One felt at home nearby. There are many possible ways to see the world to whom we should be fair. When someone spoke, his face thought, and his eyebrow said it. The words weren't always comforting. Calculated to nudge us along to that place just over there where we would be, where we would be safe for the night. That's it. So that poem gives me the feeling of being in sacred space with you. But also, you know, knowing that Robert Bly wrote this poem, you know, in bed first thing as he got up in the morning, uh, as a tribute, as an homage to Bill Stafford, because that's the way Bill did it. And then to write a poem about Bill, right, about how he basically created sacred space for people uh, and was able to sort of guide them to a place that was close to the water so you could take that nourishment. Um, but not feel afraid. And it was just so beautiful. And I wanted to share that with you. So I'll read this poem again, and then we'll close the session. What Bill Stafford was like. With small steps, he climbed very high mountains and offered distinctions to persuasive storms, delicacies at the edge of something larger, a comfort in walking on ground close to water. Something large, but it wasn't an animal snorting in a cave, more like the rustling of a thousand small winged birds, all together, comfortable in a field, feeding. One felt at home nearby. There are many possible ways to see the world to whom we should be fair. When someone spoke, his face thought, and his eyebrow said it. The words weren't always comforting, but calculated to nudge us along to that place, just over there, where we would be safe for the night. All right. So uh, that's, that's the end of our session, and now I will close our session. So our next session is gonna be next Sunday, same time. It's free, open to the public. Uh, please do invite others, the more the better, so that we keep these sessions going longer. Uh, and if you have questions coming out of the session, post them into the question section of the next session, and I'll use that to guide my comments. And there's a link there below my video uh, to join the next session. All right, so with that, I will hereby close this session of our shared sacred space. Thank you for holding the space with me and thank you for sharing the nourishment, the emotional nourishment, the spiritual nourishment of this sacred space with me. Go in peace. Uh, I give you my blessing. Go bestowed with blessing, free of fear, free of threat, and free of the undue control of others. Have a great day. Have a great week. And I will see you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you.